I want to talk to you today about judging and exposing the ministries of false prophets. Okay, now one of the big supposed heresies of our modern time here, the Laodicean church age, is judging other people. And I'm going to show you that there are some condemnations in the Bible about judging. There definitely are. There are some instances when you should not judge someone. Okay, but then again, there are some instances when you should, when you actually have a duty to judge. So we're going to look at here, if you want to go to Matthew chapter 7 a while, and if you get to talking to lost people, and you should if you're a Christian, and you definitely will run into lost people when you are saved, you will find that most of them, although this is kind of starting to go away because more and more people are just so ignorant of, of what the Bible teaches, but most people will have two verses memorized from the, the Bible, lost people. And that is John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. They'll have that one memorized, and they will have this one right here, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. They'll have that one memorized too. Why? Because the two seem to go hand in hand. God so loved the world. See? God loves everybody. He loves everything. He loves sin. He loves... See? They'll take that and you say, actually, that's not true. God says that you're a sinner. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. And they'll say, judge not that ye be not judged. See? Kind of funny. But, you know, the best way to answer somebody when they do that, when they say, judge not that ye be not judged. The best way I've found it to, to answer that is, the Bible says that? Really? Um, what chapter and verse? Where's that at in the Bible? Because 99% of the time, they have no idea. They know it's in there somewhere. You know, I, I'm not really sure it's, it's in there somewhere. Um, uh, uh, but that usually stumps them right there. Because you see, of course, if they actually knew where the verse was and actually turned to it and read the context of it, they would see that their little theory there about don't judge my sin, that doesn't work. Okay, we're going to see that in this study. Let's take a look at this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Hmm. In other words, verse 5 there is saying, you can judge people. But what's going on there in the passage? In the passage it's saying, if you are guilty of a sin, when you judge somebody else for that sin, it's going to come back on you. God's going to judge you. God holds you to a standard. Okay? Very important to remember that. And so, if you are out there and you're attacking sodomy, you oh, a bunch of wicked sodomites, you bunch of dirty perverts, and blah, 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 and you yourself are looking at pornography and getting your thrills from looking at sodomy, both women and women and men and men, if you're doing that and condemning sodomy, out in the public, you're condemned sodomy, but privately, you're getting thrills from it. God's going to judge you harshly for that. And you have no right to judge a sodomite when you yourself are entertained by him. And by the way, let me just take it to the next level. Okay. Um, how is it that a Christian can watch television shows when sodomy is openly promoted? You say, well, they aren't taking their clothes off. Okay, but are they telling jokes about sodomy? and kind of making fun of straight people, you know? And you laugh at that. And then you turn around and you judge the sodomite, and you say the sodomy is wicked, and you yourself are being entertained by them. Brethren, there would have been a time when you could have debated the thing of television, you know, you go back to the 1950s or 60s, and should you watch it, should you watch it, should you... Should it? That time has long since passed. Television has always been mind control since the very beginning. That's the purpose of Hollywood. But the fact is, today, right now, if you're a Christian and you are watching television for any reason of any kind, you are in sin. 
You say, well, I got to know the news. I have to know what's going on. Get it off the internet. Read a newspaper. See, you're addicted. If you watch news every single night or day or whatever else, you're addicted to it. And you know why you're addicted? Because they have mind control triggers all throughout the news media. All right. Now, again, I want to do a study on this eventually, but, you know, it's just going to require so much time. And, and you know, that's getting more and more difficult as time goes by here. But, you know, the fact is, if you look at news, many, many news broadcasts will have revolving circles somewhere in the background. Okay. Proven to put you into a hypnotic state. They will also have flashing lights throughout the news media presentation. And then they will have pretty women with glossy lipstick on their lips and usually low cut tops <laughs> telling you what to, th to believe and telling you the news. What's that all about? Or attractive men, you know, to attract the women. And they also, they'll cut to things. They'll say, okay, now joining us in the weather room and it'll go whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. They'll have these, whoosh, these swishing noises, you know, and real exciting mu music, you know, da, 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 like that, you know, as the news is coming on and, and also, what is it? It's mind control. And I'm telling you right now, if you're watching that, you really have no right to judge other people that are watching things that are wicked and doing things that are wicked because you yourself are partaking in it. I used to be a hardcore television viewer. I mean, I watched it all the time. It was on all the time. And the Lord convicted me and said, you need to get rid of that thing. And I took that television out and I shot it with a gun. Okay. It wasn't, well, I sold it and I got a good price. I shot the thing and destroyed it. Picked up all the little pieces of glass and everything else, put it in the garbage, and that was it. That was that. No more television. We do not have a television in our home, and we never will. Okay? There are other ways that you can get your news if you have to get it. All right? I mean, you're, you know, again, you really don't need to know anything other than the Bible. You know, the Bible is the best, you know, news uh, broadcast, forecast, or whatever out there. So... But there are all kinds of other things. If you are, you know, secretly drinking, you have no right to judge a drunk out there. If you are, you know, a, a rotten, stinking hypocrite and you tell dirty jokes at work and you, you got a real foul mouth at work, you have no right to come into the body of believers and the congregation of the saints and start saying, you know, oh, I, I you know, judging somebody because they, they let a, a dirty word slip or something like this or whatever. See, judge yourself. That's what this passage is going is all about here. It's saying you judge yourself, and then once you have there, it says, once you have the beam out of thine own eye, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Yeah, you know, it's a good testimony as well. You come out and you say, Hey, you know what? You need to stop watching pornography. You know, you know why I know that? Because I used to be addicted. I used to be a porn addict. And so I can say, hey, you over there? Here's how you stop watching pornography. And they say, well, how do you know about it? Because I used to watch it. See? But I had to remove that beam out of my own eye before I could judge their sins. And it would have been hypocritical for me to put up a message when I myself was continuing to do it. See? So I did not preach against pornography until I had that thing cleaned out of my life. And I am not going to preach, I didn't preach against television until I had that going out of my life. See, self-judgment starts the process of you being able to judge people. And if you're living in sin, then you have no right to judge other people for those sins. That's all that's going on here. All right? That's what's going on. But you see, why do lost people bring up that passage? Because they don't want their sins to be reproved. You know, the Bible talks about us being light and that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. See? They don't want to be judged. And yet, ironically, when they bring up that verse, they are judging you. Interesting how that works, isn't it? But we're going to see today what the Bible says about this thing of judging. Are we supposed to judge false prophets? Are we supposed to just go through the world and just say, okay, um, 
I'm just going to live and let live and just not care about what other people do. And, and, you know, hey, you know, as long as you aren't hurting anybody, you can do whatever you feel like doing and blah, blah, blah. Is that what we're supposed to do as Christians? So we're going to find out today in this study. Jump over to verse 15 there in Matthew chapter 7. Okay, now we're going to start getting into the thing of false prophets. Matthew chapter 7 verse 15 says here, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. All right. Uh, so how can you tell if somebody's a false prophet or not? By the spiritual fruit that their ministry bears. All right. Now you can look at a lot of ministries out there and you can say, okay, take Billy Graham as a for instance. Okay. Now, has Billy Graham produced fruit? Sure. Has he had an impact on the world? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, what kind of fruit has he produced? Has he made Christianity stronger? Or has he brought it to its knees, bowing down to the Pope? Uh, the second option there. Because of what Billy Graham did, he has brought many, many people back that aren't even real converts. He's brought them to the point where they're now bowing to the Pope. Why? Because Billy Graham does. <laughs> Billy Graham has come out publicly and said about, you know, I'm a friend of the Pope and everything else. And, you know, I've spoken in his church, Pope John Paul II, you know, and, and the Pope is almost an evangelist. You can look all this stuff up, you know. And it's just, you know, if you want to watch the video, I'm not sure if I'm going to release it before this one or after this one. I'm not sure yet. But, uh, you know, God's Ambassador, you know, this, this book that's put out by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and it shows him sitting there with the Pope and buddy-buddy and, buddy and with all these world leaders and stuff. See, what are the fruits of Billy Graham's ministry? They're rotten. They're bad. So you can judge a false prophet by the fruit that comes from his ministry. And you say, um, well, that was maybe back then. Maybe Jesus was just speaking back then. Maybe there's no future prophecy. You know where I'm going with this if you know your Bible well. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 through 5. One of the favorite tactics of the lost false prophets is to relegate a lot of the Bible, its, its relevance to the past, and say, well, that was true back then, but not anymore today. It's not really not really there today. We're going to see about that. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Has that happened? Mm-hmm. Is it going to continue to happen? Oh, yeah. I mean, you have so many people now that are claiming to be Jesus Christ. You have this Vissarian nut over in Russia that you know looks like the stereotypical pictures of this hippie guy that, you know, this pot-smoking, you know, long-haired hippie that just is peaceful and loving, you know, and all that stuff that's in the Roman Catholic paintings, you know. That's what Vissarion looks like. I have a study on him. You can watch that. But, you know, there's a, another guy, and he just, I saw this thing, and he just stands there and looks at people. Comes out on the stage and just looks at people. And, and it, you know, women all through the crowd, and they're just, oh, 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 and stuff, you know, just guys standing there looking. <laughs> you know, it's insane. And all because he looks like Jesus Christ, you know. So, are there other Christs? Oh, yeah. And, of course, that's just the fake imposters. But you also have Roman Catholic priests, as I showed in my study from last week. Every Roman Catholic priest, according to Catholic doctrine, is another Christ. Hmm. And interestingly, too, a lot of the you know Protestant men that go off to the seminary, you say, oh, what's the seminary? It's my alma 
Mater. Your, uh, I forget what the, Alma means like birth mother or caring mother, whatever else. But I've even heard it said that it can mean virgin mother. So if you have a virgin mother, then you are a Christ. And, you know, a lot of these people, you know, don't you speak against the man of God. You know, he's anointed, he's holy, he's, you know, some kind of other Christ. Hmm. That's why your standard's always here. It's always this book. It's never a man. That's another way to tell a false prophet. Does he take people away from the book and put the authority on himself? Hmm. But you see there, Jesus prophesies and says deception is going to be huge. <laughs> Many people are going to be deceived in these last days. And of course, you know, Matthew chapter 24 is pointed doctrinally at the nation of Israel. Sure. And I have a whole expository study on this chapter. All right. That's what's going on there. But it's been, as it's been said, you know, as I've said in other studies, Matthew chapter 24 is over here in the time of Jacob's trouble. And we are here in the church age. But you see, as we're getting closer and the rapture is somewhere in between there, the pre-tribulation rapture, you know, it's somewhere in between there. We don't know when it's going to happen. But as we are moving closer to Matthew chapter 24, the picture of Matthew chapter 24 is becoming clearer and clearer and clearer. And at some point in time, whoop, we go up and those poor people that are left here, specifically so those Jewish people, are going to go into that time there. Just amazing. And in that time, more and more people, you're going to have the Antichrist, the man who appears to be Jesus Christ, I believe. I believe he's going to be a perfect counterfeit, an imposter Christ. And that's why the whole world's going to worship him. A whole lot more can be said about that, which I've talked about in other studies. But you're also going to have small individual men claiming to be the return of Jesus Christ. Deception is going to go through the roof after the body of Christ leaves. And by the way, part of that deception is already here with this whole anti-rapture movement. Because you see, they're already having to plan to cover up for the rapture of the body of Christ. So you have people that call themselves King James only, and they're already covering it up. They're coming out with all these ridiculous theories like uh, this Jesuit, you know, created the rapture theory and stuff. Then why do I see it in my Bible? And why is it that the Roman Catholic Church's official position is a post-trib rapture? which I've talked about in my one pre-trib rapture moment. It's kind of weird, isn't it? And, you know, you, you see this, this, this stupid theory about, you know, oh, the Jesuit, you know, Ribeiro or some kind of thing like this. He created the rapture theory. And you say, what's your proof? Well, this website. Okay, you go to the website. What's your proof? This other website. You go to that one. This other website. This other website. This other website. That other website. It's ridiculous. They were talking about the rapture in the first and second century. And of course, it's in the Bible itself. You compare scripture with scripture. But getting back to our study here, Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, jump down there. It says, And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And it's very interesting, the thing about false prophets, because one of their favorite tactics that they like to use, they like to use love. Let's spread the love. They'll use love. Don't judge people. Let's just learn to love. Things aren't getting worse, you know. Things And, and, and when they get worse, you know, Oh, we just need to love each other and look overlook differences and overlook those nasty little things like truth and doctrine, you know, and stuff like that. See, it's amazing. And what are they actually causing? They're causing hatred. I mean, look at some of the followers of these false prophets that I've rebuked in other videos like Paul Big Lie and Kenneth Dopeland, you know. Uh, look at some of their followers. They get on my videos. They, they are filled with venom and hatred like you just can't believe. It's incredible. Why? Well, because many false prophets will arise and deceive many. You know? Interesting. Jump down to verse 23 in Matthew chapter 24. 
Matthew chapter 24, verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The very elect in that passage, of course, being Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But you see it there again. This thing of many false Christs are going to arise, many false prophets also, and they're going to try to deceive people. Deception is running rampant. I mean, there are things, you know, just this week, just a few days ago, you know, we have switched. We're not using anything for cooking other than just olive oil, olive oil or coconut oil. You know, those are really the, the two oils, you know, that are good to use. We don't use canola oil or, or you know, some of the other ones, vegetable oil and things like that because it's soy, basically. And so we were very happy. You know, here we're using olive oil and stuff. And I found out that there are certain brands of olive oil that are predominantly soy oil. And I'm thinking, what? You know, here I'm spending all this extra money on this stuff that's they're calling it olive oil, and it's soy oil. And I just, oh, you know, <laughs> it gets wearing after a while. You know, I love mayonnaise, and it's like you look, you go to the store, and there's a whole row of mayonnaise, and you're like, soy oil, soy oil, soybean oil, hydrogenated this and that, and high fructose corn syrup. So it's like, well, okay, cut that out of my diet, and. You know, I mean, deception is amazing. You go to the organic aisle in the store and you look at organic types of things, high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> it's just, ah, you know, is it going to get better? Well, it will when the Lord comes back, you know, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns with us, his saints, in Revelation chapter 19, sets up his millennial kingdom, it's going to be great then. But until then, there's deception. And, you know, don't ever think that you've arrived at all truth, you know. I mean, unless it's all truth is Jesus Christ, I realize he is truth personified. But what I'm saying is the deception is so great now, you're going to be finding things out all the time. I mean, if you're looking in researching, every single week you're going to find things and you just go, oh, I was deceived again. Oh, brother. <laughs> it gets frustrating, but stick with it, you know. It will be worth it all. Uh, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. But getting back to the study here, uh, turn next to Acts chapter 20, verse 20. You say, well, okay, I see it there in Matthew, you know, but what about instruction for a Christian living today? What we would call the church age. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. What's, what's the responsibility for a Christian that's in ministry? Paul writing here, he says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. I heard it said the one time, they said, Do you have 2020 vision? And uh, referring to this verse, you know, teaching people publicly and from church building to church building. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, it says house to house. <laughs> you know, but he kept back nothing from them. You see? Now, I try to do that. I try to answer people's questions. I know that there has been, I mean, I've gone to the church buildings and, and you just go there and you sit there through these dead sermons most of the time and there's very little that you come away with. And there's so many questions that people have nowadays. You can't answer all those things when you're forced into the 9 to 12 schedule of the Babel buildings. You know, you have to come online. You have to, to, to go out there and seek the answers. And that's the way it's supposed to be, brethren. Okay. I mean, even if you are in a Babel building and you're like, I'm not leaving, whatever else, you're still going to have to do research on your own. Okay, You still have to get that relationship between you and the Lord worked out where He is teaching you. But a ministry that's real should keep back nothing from you. All right, Now, it doesn't mean you're going to ask me for my personal information. I kept back nothing from you. I'll just tell you everything. No, it's talking about the whole counsel of God, the Word of God. Okay, I try to preach... Whatever's in this book, I try to preach it according to it is in the scriptures, as it is in the scriptures here. You know, I try to do a lot of work, try to do a lot of research to bring out the truth. You know, there are a lot of, I mean, I've, my ministry, my calling has always been in the area of subject matter preaching. I can do expository study. I have done some of that, but the Lord has always kind of pulled me back over to subject matter preaching. 
because I know that there's a lot of people out there that aren't willing to cover certain subjects, and I am. I'm willing to stick my neck out there and uh, preach things that are controversial or that uh, put me in uh, disfavor among some of the brethren. Whatever, <laughs> you know, that's just the way I do things. So I do that aspect of the ministry. I try to feed the flock of God. But now does that mean I should never judge anybody or never expose false prophets? Because I've gotten that from a lot of the brethren, you know. Well, you're not feeding anybody. You're just, you know, blah, blah, blah. You're just attacking people and exposing people and stuff. Let's continue about and see about this thing here. Jump down to verse 26. We'll see this thing again here. It says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All right. Uh, there's not any part of the Bible I'm not going to talk about. All right. I try to do my very best. But do I have preaching on every single subject that you run across? No. But I'm trying to do that. I don't have a sub or a, a sermon on the subject of judging, specifically on this subject. That's why I'm doing this study. So then in the future, I have this as part of the whole body of preaching that I've put out. Somebody says, hey, did you ever do a sermon on gold and silver? Well, I have an old one that I did. I need to redo that. But I have an old one. Uh, did you ever do a thing on um, whatever, on all the different subjects? And I can point people to these different things. That's what this sermon is. This sermon will be the one on judging. The right times to judge, the wrong times to judge, when you should, who you should judge, whatever else. That's what's going on here. But again, I've tried to you know, declare unto you, the body of Christ, all the counsel of God. The things the Lord has taught me, I try to teach you. Commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also, as I'm supposed to do. But now let's look at verse 28. I'm going to read down to verse 32. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. I try to do that. I try to take the oversight. I try to warn you because you're going to be told by lost people you shouldn't judge. You shouldn't judge. Yes, you should. And I'm showing you the scriptures for it. But now look at verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after, after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Okay, just stop there for a minute. Very interesting. I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Lost people, lost grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They have no love for the sheep. They're just in there to kill them. He said, give me an example. Okay, Martin Richling. Martin Richling, the guy is just disgusting. And his videos were just attacking me and putting me down personally and just, just making fun of me and mocking me the whole way through. Not proving anything. Okay? I answered the guy. Some of the brethren got upset. What are you spending time answering the guy for? Because he's very dangerous. He's a very dangerous false prophet. And I hope and pray. I mean, I had a guy, one of his little followers, a newer follower of his came, come along and he sent me a bunch of, you need to watch, you know, Pastor Richling's, you know, videos and, and he'll straighten you out doctrinally and stuff like this because you're not saved and blah, blah, blah. And I wrote back to the guy and I said, hey, friend, I said, you're being deceived by this guy. Martin Richling is a habitual fornicator. He's a bad, bad man. A very, very wicked man. And I said, you know, you need to get away from that guy. And he wrote back, oh, you're crazy. Blah, 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 blah. Huh? Whatever. Bye-bye. You know. Martin Richling is a false prophet. He is a wolf. And he is a, he is a man that is a habitual fornicator. He's been in federal prison. I mean, the guy's a bad, bad man. He's not legitimate. But look at verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, now look at this, to draw away disciples after them. Did you know that there are saved brethren that have brought out videos against me? Mm -hmm. Why? Well, a lot of times it's because, and I'll just say this, you know, you can take it for what it's worth, a lot of times their channels aren't getting any kind of recognition. They bring out videos against me, and they get a lot of views. And all of a sudden I look and I see these videos, and it's like, all these brethren that used to be friends of mine and used to follow the ministry and, and used to say, hey, I appreciate what you're doing, Brian, and we might not agree, but I appreciate what you're doing. All of a sudden they're going, 
I'm not watching him anymore. Yeah, let's all agree. Let's not watch him. Let's boycott him. What's going on? Saved brethren springing up and they're saying, let's uh, join together here and go against Brian. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, the, the source for all truth or something like this. And I never make mistakes. I make plenty of mistakes. But what's this backstabbing stuff all about? You know, irritates me. But you see, I, part of my ministry is to warn people night and day about false prophets. You see, that's part of teaching the word of God. If I don't give you, if I only am giving you, feeding you and feeding you and feeding you, and yet never teach you how to defend yourself in a fight, what kind of a preacher am I? What kind of a pastor would I be if I was not feeding the flock and telling you, okay, here's how to spot false prophets. Here's how to judge false prophets. Here's how to fight against them. That's what I'm supposed to do. And again, Another purpose of the ministry here is in verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. If you've learned nothing else from this ministry, you will see this is the authority right here. The word of God. God's holy word. This is the authority. All right? And when people start to deny the book and they, they, don't, and they don't rightly divide it and whatever else, if the Lord tells me to expose them, I'm going to expose them. I mean, a lot of people, you know, uh, they, they say, could you expose so-and-so? Could you expose so-and-so? A lot of times I don't. Why? I'm too busy to, you know? Other times I see, hey, this is, a, this is a major problem here. This person's really deceiving a lot of people. They're whatever. And I can use this to teach Bible doctrine. See? I mean, I, I attacked Paul Big Lie, Begley, you know, here recently. Why? Because I wanted to have a video against the crucifix to show people, to show Christians, you shouldn't have a crucifix in your home. It is a satanic symbol. All right? That's why I did that study. And I'm showing that just because somebody's called a Baptist doesn't mean that they are a Bible believer. He's not a Bible believer, and he is a is he, he's a uh, closet Catholic, all right, married to a Catholic. And he's always don't cut on the Catholics, don't say things against the Catholics, and you know the Catholics are okay and all this stuff. One of the reasons why I'm so hard on the Catholics is because I know what they do when they get into power. And right now, we still have freedom. I, mean, I saw one of the comments, one of the, the brethren out there said it, and I thank you for the comment. You know who you are. They said, Brian sticks his neck out, and if it was, you know, four or five hundred years ago, back during the, the Reformation years, I would have been dead years ago, okay? If the Catholics were in charge and had their way, they would kill me slowly, okay? And my wife. They would murder us. Okay. That's why I'm fighting so hard against Catholicism, because I'm trying to keep them out of power as long as possible, trying to expose their evil deeds so that we can still retain some freedom and stay away from the Inquisition, which they still have, by the way. The Office of Inquisition is still there. Ratzinger used to be the head of that. But, you know, oh, don't judge, Brian, don't judge. You shouldn't judge false prophets. Well, then uh, don't watch the videos when I bring them out, okay? Go next to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the wisdom which man's not in the words, excuse me, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Let me stop right there for another minute. That's why when you have somebody that says, I have lost relatives and they can't understand the King James. We should change the King James. Uh, no, because lost people, natural men, you know, lost people cannot understand the Word of God. 
They can understand certain parts of the Talmud they're a sinner. That's why they avoid it. But they can't truly understand all the mysteries of Scripture. See? So you don't bring the Bible down to the level of the lost world. That's why it's funny because I've seen actually seen some lost people and they say, I can understand this NIV better than the King James. You know? Yeah, because it's written by lost people for lost people. That's why they can understand it. Verse 15. Now here's another key scripture. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You know one of the best ways to judge something? Is if you have the law in writing. Christian, do you have a perfect standard by which you can judge things? Do you know that you only can say that if you are a King James Bible believer? If you say, well, you know, whatever version you feel like reading, you know, there's, you know, just whatever, pick the one you, that you like, you don't have a perfect standard. You can't truly judge things. Because, see, if you judge me from your NIV, I can turn around and judge you from a new King James version. If you judge me from the new King James, I can judge you from an RSV or a new RSV or whatever, whatever. Only a Christian that has one authority they're the only ones that can truly judge. And again, you know, if you don't know about the issue, study that. Go to, you know, my website there, kingjamesvideoministries.com. We have, you know, hundreds of videos for free that you can watch and get educated about this Bible version issue. And again, you know, this goes back to the thing, he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Why? Because he's cleaned up his life. He's taken that beam out of his own eye before he judges the moat in his brother's eye. See how that thing works? See that? If you're spiritual, you're judging yourself so that you can judge other people. And see, again, judge, you know, we have, you know, our society has turned it into this negative connotation, but you have to remember, judgment is not always bad. All right? When a judge stands up there and he hears the, the case and he's sitting there, that judge is going to say one of two things. He's going to say either guilty or innocent right so judgment could be a good thing and people need to understand that when I judge you and I tell you you need to get away from the television I'm not trying to be negative I'm trying to be positive think of the free time that you'll have think of the clarity of thought that you'll have not having all those brainwashed images in your mind think about that when I tell you you need to get away from pornography you're going to have a clean mind. When I tell you you need to quit drinking, when I tell you you need to quit smoking, you're going to have better health. When I say stay away from gluttony, that's judgmental, Brian. Well, yes, it is. And it's judging in the right way. When you get back into good shape, physical condition, you're going to feel much better and have much better energy. You see, judgment is a good thing as long as it lines up with Scripture. It's important to get that. Next, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. So Paul didn't even need to be there. He's like, I, I don't even need to hear about this thing. I don't even need to know the guy or his family or he's a real nice guy. Or I've judged already. You know? Get the guy out of there. Verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when, we, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, what's the judgment there? Kick the guy out of your congregation so that God can judge him. And what does God, what's the way that God judges him? You know, and here's a very, another very important thing. Oftentimes the way God will judge a Christian and, and whether, you know, what he'll, he'll do there in the life of a Christian is, depending on how much sin you are messing around with in your life is how much God will keep the devil back from you. 
If you're messing around a lot in sin, God will let the devil loose on you. You don't want that. You know, all these nutty charismaniacs out there that are like, you know, oh, the devil's not anything. He's just, you know, a little loser and whatever else. I bind him and, you know, oh, get away from me, devil. Uh, most of those are servants of Satan. That's why they're saying that. Trying to trying to deceive you on the seriousness of, of how evil the devil is. You don't want the devil coming after you. Okay? I know God is greater and everything else, but, you, you know, when you're dealing with a being that's at least 6,000 years old, um, you don't want that. You don't want him coming after you and then the Lord saying, okay, go ahead. Do whatever you want to him. They're living in sin. They aren't convicted by my word, reading my word, so go ahead. That's a bad thing. <laughs> Very bad thing. We're going to see about that later too as we continue here. But uh, jump down to verse 9. I wrote, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So there you see the contrast there saying, hey, God is judging those people that are out there, all right, the lost world that's outside of the body of Christ. It's not in the church, you know, the true church. But the people that are within, whose responsibility is it to judge them? You and me. That's our responsibility. And we're going to see a little bit later about that line that you cross where your judgment is wrong. There are certain things that you should not be judging other brothers or sisters about. And we're going to talk about that later on. But when it comes to something, an open sin like this, a guy is fornicating with his father's wife. And of course, you don't know if that's a stepmother or the actual birth mother. But the point is, it's wicked either way. Very wicked. And they're not judging the guy. That's a problem. You need to judge somebody like that. But look at uh, chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. It says here, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Let people go against you there. Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. You say, what's going on there? Well, recently I found out that a man has been making copies of my videos and giving them out to people, and I'm very upset about that, so I'm going to go after him. Uh, I contacted a lawyer, and we're going to be suing them in federal court, and I'm going to take away, try to take away his house and things like that because he's been selling my copyrighted videos. Huh? That's what a Christian would do? No, that's what secular lost people do. Um, all videos I've ever put out are not copyrighted. Not one. People making copies of my videos, and I realize people cut my videos up and they, they make me look like a fool sometimes because they have me saying things and they don't. you don't look at the whole context of what I'm saying. You only look at these little parts that people cut out. You can, you can do that with the Bible, okay? There are parts of Scripture that you can cut out cut out little parts of verses and make the Bible contradict itself and all kinds of things like that. You have to look at the context. So, you know, if they do it with the Bible, they'll do it with my ministry. They'll do it with yours if you're putting videos out, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not going to take anybody to court on it. Okay? I am not going to court. 
I avoid the court system. You say, well, then what do you do about these people that are lying about you, Brian? Um, I let God handle it. I know that these people are lying about me. I know that there's a lot of people here on YouTube. It's more and more all the time. Some of these people that are coming out, you know, and, and they're lying about me, just, just telling ridiculous nonsense lies. I don't watch a lot of it, but sometimes I'll just watch one or two, you know, and somebody will send it to me. Hey, do you know, hey, Brother Brian, do you know that this person's saying this about you? And I'll look at it and it's just like, oh boy, you know. Now I can take that person to court. I could say, I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to say, you know, this person has taken my videos and they're, they're making copies and they're doing blah, 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 blah. And I could try to make, settle things with lost people, the lost people who run YouTube. Or I could just say, you know what? God's going to work it out. And that's always been my practice. God's going to work it out. That's just the way it is. That's the way I believe. And somebody like that, that's lying about me and whatever else, if God turns him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, I pity him. And, you know, I've seen that thing. I have seen a couple times where people that I've run across in my ministry years, where I talk to them and I try to show them the truth about whatever else, and, and they... They turn against me and they, they turn against the truth. You know, it's not so much about me as, as it is the truth. I've seen the Lord destroy him. It's amazing. And, you know, that's the way it is a lot of times. I mean, we another problem I want to address here without going off on too big of a tangent, <laughs> and that is we work so hard to get God out of our lives today in the 21st century. So, what are you talking about? Well, all the insurance policies and all the everything that we get ourselves into and, and all this stuff, God can't really work. And if I had all kinds of legal things and all kinds of copyrights and team of lawyers and all this other stuff, how could God ever do anything for me? How could God step in and take action? My lawyers beat him to it. See? So what I do is I just step back and, and let God take care of the thing. I just say, Lord, I, I can't keep track of all this stuff that people are doing, lying about me, whatever else. You step in and take care of it. And, you know, I do believe that there are brethren out there that are saved, that are former friends or whatever, and they're lying about me now. And it's just like they're doing it through ignorance or whatever else. And, and I hope that God doesn't tear them down too hard for that. You know, we're going to see that later on in this study here. But... Anyhow, I'm not going to keep going on a rant there. Turn next to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. We're going to see another thing about judging here. This isn't an easy one to do, by the way. Sometimes this is kind of tough. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 through 32. And this is the purpose, by the way. I did my sermon last week about the 13 reasons why Christians have to reject the Mass. The Mass, sell, uh, the, the, I was going to sell it called a celebration. It's more of a celebration. Um, the mass celebration is all about that sacrifice, that perpetual eating of God. You know, okay, yeah, cookie. You know, that's God in there and drink his blood. Uh, very warped, very satanic. It's about salvation. Um, communion for Christians is not about uh, salvation. All right, what it is about is you staying in fellowship with the Lord. It's a time of reflection, a time for you to think about what Jesus did on the cross and to remember how severe a death he had to die and the fact that he probably doesn't appreciate it too much when you are continuing in the sins that he paid for on the cross. You know, It's not about, well, I've, I've done this certain sin, so I've lost my salvation now or something like that. That's not what it's about. Okay? What it's about is you examining yourself to, to get back into the right fellowship with the Lord. That's what's going on here in this passage. We're going to start here at verse 28. It says here, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That's what happens as a Christian when you start to mess around with sin. All right? You will get weak and sickly, and if it keeps going and you don't quit the sin, God might have to take you home early. Interesting. 
Look at verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Hmm. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Okay? The reverse of that is judge yourself so you don't have to be judged. By who? By God. Verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. See? Right there. Very interesting. Go next to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. One of the best things that you can do as a Christian is to judge yourself. Keep yourself in right fellowship with the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 through 31. You say, but Brian, somebody has really wronged me. I mean, somebody, I mean, like I said, I mean, some of these videos out there are just ridiculous. Attacks against me. And it's just like, you know, some of the comments and things. I mean, I've had to, I've had to remove people, you know, ban people from my channel that had been longtime viewers because they, they, they just get nutty after a while. And they're just attacking me personally and whatever else. And, I, you know, I have, I have a lot more grace than people think. You know, I've put up with a lot of things over the years. And I try to put up with the brethren and stuff like that. But when it just gets ridiculous and absurd and, you know, they're hurting people that are coming on, you know, to the channel and stuff, I'm just like, okay, you know, I got to ban you from my channel. Goodbye. You know, and I see somebody's just stuck in some rut and they're just bitter about something that we've had a disagreement with in the past. But anyhow, Hebrews chapter 10, you say, how do I get back at somebody? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now specifically, I've talked about this in my uh, our House Church Christians violating Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. That sermon, I talked about these verses here. So it's specifically pointed towards the Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Very interesting study if you go through that thing verse by verse, which I already did in that other study, so we're not going to do it here. But the fact of the matter is, if you want to get somebody real vengeance, you know, revenge against somebody, if you want to do that, the best thing that you can do is just you do right. You judge yourself and then let God judge that person. If you're doing right and that person, you know, is messed up on something, if they're really right with God, if they're really trying and things like that, they will eventually see the truth. They will eventually be won over to your side. And if they aren't won over to your side, God's going to judge them. Harshly sometimes. So, But again, are we supposed to judge as Christians? Yeah, we are. But make sure that you're not being hypocritical with that judgment. But we talked about earlier there in Matthew chapter 7, this thing about by their fruits ye shall know them. Okay, So you can see the fruits of a false prophet. But are there other ways that you can tell if somebody's a false prophet? We're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to look up some really interesting verses here. Jeremiah chapter 14. Jeremiah 14 verse 11 through 16. We're going to see that one of the many tests of false prophets in the Bible um, when they're actually coming out and telling, oh, God showed me this and God showed me that, you know, and, and they're lying to you. And we're going to see, we're going to see in these verses here, this next couple passages, we're going to see why they're lying. John chapter 14, verse 11 through 16 says here, Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. <laughs> then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. Gee, there's none of that today, is there? Yeah, right. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, 
and I sent them not. Yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, them their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. And that's what I think is going to happen, unfortunately, to a lot of the followers of these people like Paul, Big Lie, Begley, excuse me, and Kenneth Copeland. A lot of those people, they're very well-meaning a lot of times, but they do not want to hear negative things. And they want to hear the negative, but then they want to have the positive with it, you know, and all this, we're having revival and everything else. That's what they want to hear. And these guys are coming and they're saying, God showed me this thing. God came to me in a dream. He came to me in a vision and I spake this, I spoke this prophecy and, oh, it's just amazing. And, and you look at their prophecy and mostly it's, it's positive types of things. You say, uh, well, why would they do that? Why would they prophesy positive things when in reality negative things are coming? Why? Because they're after your money. That's why. And you're a lot more likely to fork out money when you think good times are ahead than when bad times are ahead. That's how that thing works. And I'm going to tell you right now, people are going to say, well, you preach the rapture. That's You're doing the same thing. No, the rapture is Bible doctrine. The rapture, I believe, uh, is going to be more like a um, helicopter being helicopter lifted out of a battle zone <laughs> than it will be this nice, happy, glorious little thing. And it will be happy and glorious, don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying the world condition is going to be very, very bad, I believe, when the rapture happens. All right. How bad? I don't know. I mean, I'm amazed at God's long-suffering and God's grace up to this point and His mercy for the country of America and the UK and most of the other civilized nations out there. It's just amazing what the Lord is letting people get away with. You say, well, why would He do that if He's a just God? Well, because He's also a merciful God. And there are people out there that still need to be saved before we leave. Turn next to Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 4. Okay, so you saw the false prophets there back in Jeremiah chapter 14. Now we're in Jeremiah chapter 23. It says here, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now the, the total fulfillment of this is, of course, going to be through the time of Jacob's trouble into the millennial kingdom. All right. Um, if you study the whole thing out, we, when we come back as Christians, glorified saints, we're going to rule with Jesus Christ as kings and priests. All right. True priests, okay, not Catholic priests. And we will be teaching those people, depending on your service here in this life, you'll either be a king or a priest. Okay, I believe that. Or maybe both. I'm not sure how the whole thing's going to work out yet. A lot of that stuff, I don't think we can really know until we go to be with the Lord. But the point is, those people that go into the millennial kingdom, those Jews that are scattered right now are going to be brought back to the land of Israel. And that's when they're going to be running out into the wilderness. The Antichrist is going to be coming after them. Revelation 19, Jesus Christ and the saints come down, wipe out the Antichrist and his armies. And then the judgment of the nations, we go out, gather the rest of the people for judgment. And the sheep go in, into the, excuse me, the sheep go into the kingdom. The goats go into the lake of fire. So, that thing there is what's really being described here in this passage. But notice again, there's the thing of false pastors. And they are scattering the sheep. Why? Because they're not feeding them. They're destroying and scattering the sheep. I mean, you know, just a, a shepherd takes the sheep and, and goes out into a pasture someplace and there's no grass there, there's no running water around or whatever else. And they're going, uh, we're kind of hungry. And the sh shepherd's like deal with it, you know, 
you're here in this in this uh, special place here. You know, don't you're not here to be fed. You're to, here to do something for us or whatever. And that's what a lot of these uh, hirelings do in these Babel buildings. They aren't feeding the people. And so what happens? The sheep are scattered. And I thank the Lord for the internet because you can the sheep that are scattered can come on here and they can learn from the Word of God. I've learned a lot of what you know I learned. Most of, of my study and, and things, you know, how I was taught came from being online, came from videos and books and things which most of it's here yet, you know, that I've read and, and whatever. I didn't learn this stuff in Babel buildings. Okay. I had to go out and find this information on my own predominantly, you know. But uh, let's go to John chapter 10. We're going to be back here into the book of Jeremiah, but for now let's go to John chapter 10. And we're going to see this thing about the hireling. 